Well, the Australian Army attempted to assist Vietnam to create a viable security apparatus, primarily through the efforts of the Australian Army Training Team, the 1st Australian Task Force and the Australian Civil Affairs Unit. I'm going to begin by uh, describing the work of the Australian Army Training Team. In May 1962, the Minister for Defence announced the commitment of up to 30 instructors to Vietnam uh, to help train the South Vietnamese forces in the techniques of jungle warfare, village defence and related engineering and communications. The team was to be known as the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam. Its role was to assist in the training of the ground forces of South Vietnam. However, the importance of the team was not in the scale of the contribution it could make to training the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. After all, the US Army had 11,000 trainers in Vietnam at this time. But it was to the political support that an Australian contribution made to the international effort of the, uh, led by the US. The initial 30-man team was partly intended to establish a sense of the scale of the training effort uh, so that the size of the Australian Army training team could be adjusted uh, once a better understanding of the requirement was known. The initial team members undertook two, a two-week uh, training course before departure for Vietnam. Training covered the history of the French campaign in Indochina, uh, basic language. Uh, it was very basic, uh, only a couple of uh, lessons allocated to it. A review of the situation in, the, uh, in North Vietnam and in South Vietnam and prescribed reading. Later rotations of the training team uh, were extended to an eight-week course at the Jungle Warfare Centre in Canungra, followed by a two-week cultural and colloquial language course at the School of Military Intelligence in Sydney. The team members were highly experienced, especially those selected in the early deployments. Some had service in the late stages of the Second World War, the Korean War, the Malayan Emergency and Confrontation and some went on to have multiple tours as members of the team, developing a very deep understanding of the campaign in Vietnam and also uh, developing very close bonds with the units that they supported. There was very little doctrine available to guide the creation and role of the AATDV. PAM 11, Counter-Revolutionary Warfare, says almost nothing about training Indigenous forces. It argues that a national plan should be created, what today we'd call the whole of government approach, uh, including coordinated government action, political development, economic developments and uh, public support, and the creation of a strong and popular indigenous military force. <coughs> the doctrine states that this part of the national plan would involve training indigenous forces from the regular army down to local village militias, but it doesn't say how this should be done. At the time, training Indigenous forces was the role of the SAS. But this seems to have been conspicuously ignored in Vietnam, perhaps for very good reason. Although the SAS did perform this role in confrontation. Despite the lack of Australian doctrine covering the training of Indigenous forces, once in Vietnam, AATDV members had access to a very large collection of US Army publications dealing with training, uh, advising uh, Indigenous forces, Vietnamese culture, Vietnamese military history and so on. There was considerable debate about how the team would be deployed within Vietnam. The Vietnamese favoured concentrating the entire team in a single training centre in Quang Nai province in uh, the northern part of South Vietnam near the uh, demilitarised zone. On the other hand, the commander, US Military Assistant Command Vietnam, favoured uh, distributing individual team members to fill US Army billets uh, throughout the country. A compromise was reached in which a series of small, identifiably Australian groups of four or five men, just like the one on the screen, were distributed throughout South Vietnam um, with an elevated concentration of teams in one core tactical zone in the north of the country. Now this decision turned out to be very fortuitous because it resulted in the teams training expertise being very widely distributed throughout the country, but it also meant that deployed groups sent back to the commander AATDV a clear, independent picture of developments throughout South Vietnam. Throughout, uh, through this intelligence collection function, the requirement to boost the Australian Army training effort was identified and AATDV expanded, reaching its peak strength in 1970 
of 227 men, including then 78 corporals. But by 1970, the Army Posting Authority was having difficulty finding suitably experienced men to uh, post to AATDV. Australia at the time was uh, having a, a major training effort of its, of, a, of its own, uh, preparing battalions for deployment to Vietnam and also coping with the training of national servicemen. Training teams allocated to Vietnamese battalions typically consisted of a captain, a lieutenant, sometimes a warrant officer, and uh, uh, two sergeants, sometimes corporal specialists. Tasks varied, but they generally included advice to the unit commander on operational planning, provision of US indirect fire support to the unit, advice on logistics and advice on training. Advisors reported independently to, um, uh, on the standard achieved in their Vietnamese unit uh, that they supported, so that the, a clear picture of uh, unit performance and of the ARVN more generally started to emerge. Training team mem men were generally more experienced than their US counterparts. Uh, they were very familiar with counterinsurgency and with jungle warfare much more so than their US equivalents. They often had experience in the Malayan emergency and confrontation, and of course the Army, the Australian Army's focus uh, at that time was very tightly on counterinsurgency compared with, for example, the US uh, worldwide capability and its focus on conventional operations against the Soviet Red Army in Europe. For these reasons, the advice uh, AATD mem members uh, provided tended to carry considerable authority and it was very highly regarded both by the Vietnamese and by US advisors. Teams tended to be isolated in very small groups, uh, embedded within the US advisory team command structure. And this tended to encourage very strong relations uh, between team uh, AATDV members and the supported Arvin unit. Team members needed to understand the limitations of the supported Vietnamese units. Vietnamese battalions were much less potent than Australian or US Army infantry battalions. They were much smaller, they were usually led by majors and quite often captains. They lacked the capacity for, to operate independently below company level. They were poorly armed and only had a, a fraction of the organic firepower normally available to an Australian battalion. They also lacked the level of indirect fire support that Australian battalions enjoyed. In the early years, operations tended to be of short duration and restricted in the area they covered. So understanding these dif differences uh, was uh, important if advice was going to be provided appropriately. So uh, lessons. A number of lessons emerged from the experience of the AATDV. A small team with the right skills and experience can have a major impact. Training team members had to be chosen and assembled into teams with great care. In the Vietnam situation, they operated for lengthy periods without contact with other Australians. Individual team members had to be compatible with other members in their team. A clear system of logistic and administrative support was needed. Training team members often tended to be reliant on the goodwill of their US counterparts for logistic and administrative support. There should be a clear-headed view of the role of the training team. Was its role to train and advise Indigenous forces, or was it to add a flag to the coalition? There were some cases in which Australian advice to Vietnamese units conflicted with the advice provided by US advisers. And that brought to a head this problem of the role, the actual role of uh, the training team. Team members must accompany their units into operations. Failure to do so erodes the credibility of the training and advice delivered. However, training and advice must be provided to the Indigenous forces before contact with the enemy, not during it. Over advising occasionally emerged as a problem. As Vietnamese units improved through training and combat experience, they required less advice. Advisers needed to restrain their desire to inject advice where it wasn't needed and step back and allow confidence to build. Conversely, some Vietnamese commanders became very reliant on Australian advice, and particularly on the 
uh, provision of indirect fire support that the Australian advisers controlled. The politics, social structure and military capability of the Indigenous forces must be well understood and taken into account before training can be expected to have a positive contribution. And finally, language and cultural skills are force multipliers. They're ext extremely important. They're force multipliers for trainers. The Australian Army training team was not alone in its efforts to train Indigenous forces. In April 1969, General Creighton Abrams, Commander US Military Assistant Command Vietnam, changed the strategic direction of the war. To that point, US forces had adopted an attrition strategy aimed at bringing enemy main force elements to battle uh, where they could be destroyed with superior US firepower. But from April 1969, Abrams introduced a pacification strategy, uh, and this elevated to the top priority <coughs> excuse me, the, <coughs> the provision of security to the people of South Vietnam. Second priority was the training of Indigenous forces to improve their combat performance. Attrition of main force enemy elements slipped to third priority. Particularly from April 1969, the 1ATF Infantry Battalions uh, conducted training and joint operations with Arvin and Province Militia Forces with the aim of improving their combat performance and providing security to the people. We can see in this graph the training effort of 1ATF with some support from AATDV members in Phuc Thuy province, brought about an improvement in Indigenous force performance uh, over, the, uh, over the period uh, uh, April 69 to the end of the campaign. The, uh, the blue line represents the uh, contacts initiated by 1ATF, the red line contacts initiated by the enemy, and the green line are contacts initiated by uh, province militia forces. 1ATF began training, uh, injecting training into the, pro the province militia forces in April 1969. We can see that there was an increase in the combat performance, the number of initiated contacts that were uh, performed by province forces. They tracked uh, along pretty, pretty much the same as the enemy, but broke in 19 late 1970, broke free and started to dominate the enemy in terms of initiated contacts. So now I'd like to look at the Australian Civil Affairs Unit. In contrast to the AATDV, the Civil Affairs and uh, Military Civic Action um, is dealt with at some length in the doctrine that the Australian Army took to Vietnam. Chapter 6 of Counter-Revolutionary Warfare states the purpose of military civic action was to use the resources of the armed forces for constructive civilian activities such as the provision of improved health, education, welfare, public works, living conditions and improving the economic base of the country. A second aim was to gain the support, loyalty and respect of the people for the armed forces and to em uh, emphasise the concept of freedom and the worth of the individual. The Australian Civil Affairs Unit was responsible for over 516 uh, civic action projects in Phuc Thuy province alone. Uh, that's not counting those that uh, were performed by the RAAF in Phan Rang and other units in Saigon and Vang Tau. Those 516 civic action projects injected about 150 million Vietnamese piaster into the province economy. The projects included electricity and water articulation, building marketplaces, schools, village administration buildings, medical and dental services to Indigenous people, uh, food distribution, agricultural training and kick-starting agricultural projects like pig farming, as you can see in the photograph here, and a host of other projects. A complicating factor from the point of view of establishing lessons learned is that many projects depended uh, on the input of major 1ATF units, such as infantry battalions, the engineers, especially 17 construction squadron, signalers and Ramey tradesmen, none of which were part of ACAU. Civil Affairs Unit often coordinated projects rather than execute them itself. Lieutenant Colonel Outridge, who was 
CEO of the Civil Affairs Unit in 1970 and 71, reviewed the unit, unit's performance to derive lessons. He said that there'd been many successes, part to outreach. The number one failing of Australia's civil affairs effort was its too aggressive Australian involvement. Australians, he said, being certain of their own excellence, tended to exercise an aggressive policemanship and push Australian type solutions to correct Vietnamese muddle. They tended to ignore both the cultural and economic environment they found in South Vietnam. Neither can be changed in the short term, and intervening militaries <coughs> tend to feel under time pressure to get things done before time runs out and they're withdrawn from the theatre. Other key problems identified by outreach were apathy by local administrative administration officials towards projects, particularly if the project doesn't originate from a Vietnamese request and no Vietnamese were involved in its execution. A good example of this was one ATF's very energetic work in school maintenance. The effect of, this, uh, of the energy that one ATF put into this was that local parents and citizens committees lost interest in their own involvement in school maintenance. Over-involvement by Australian medical aid projects, um, which tended to discourage self-reliance, was also another problem. Uh, this was recognised and a program of progressive Australian withdrawal from uh, over-provision uh, of services was implemented to increase Vietnamese self-reliance, uh, producing tangible and positive results. There was also a lack of training of individual, uh, a big, big pardon, of Indigenous people uh, on project maintenance. And that led again to over-reliance on Australian personnel and to mechanical breakdowns of equipment. And the, the uh, installation of windmills is a very good example of that. Social surveys of citizens in Phuc Thuy province show um, uh, that they uh, had a very positive response initially to the reticulation of water that was a result of um, the installation of uh, windmills. But when the windmills broke down, their support very quickly waned and uh, uh, they, uh, they became quite angry at the interference with their, uh, their water supply. Initially, many of the windmills were installed by Australian engineers who lacked the technical know-how of uh, installing, uh, installation of them. And that led to their failure. Things like placing the, uh, the pump head in a, uh, in, a, in a bed of sand rather than gravel. And that caused uh, corrosion of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the pumps. Later, Southern Cross engineers were brought to Vietnam to install the windmills with much improved results. So technical expertise needs to be on tap to ensure success. Although much more research needs to be done on this issue, one of the key successes, I believe, of the civil affairs effort appears to have been the injection into the local farming community of expertise about new agricultural techniques, including the use of miracle rice. Miracle rice was a variety of rice that yielded about four times the, uh, the yield of traditional paddy rice that was used by the peasants at the time. Other things like pig and chicken husbandry were also introduced. These uh, agricultural projects that civil affairs managed gradually improved the peasants' income across the country. For example, um, miracle rice became known locally as Honda rice because a farmer who uh, who switched to it could soon afford to buy a Honda motorcycle. And you can see some of the changes to the, to, uh, this is just a snapshot of the social development in the, uh, in the province, but you can see some of the changes that occurred between 1966 when 1ATF arrived in the province and the end of 1971 when the task force was withdrawn. You can see uh, a lot of investment by the people in the province into radios, televisions and registered motorcycles. So uh, that builds the uh, uh, the uh, uh, prosperity of the community and a prosperous community is less likely to uh, want to have its roads uh, mined by the enemy, want, it's less likely to, be, to enjoy the enemy ambushing um, and, and uh, destruction of bridges. So um, what happened after the campaign? The training team and the civil affairs unit were not maintained as units on the Army Orbat. Both were dissolved after the war and there were few attempts to capture lessons learned 
so that they could be applied next time. In 1971, the Chief of the General Staff held a conference of heads of corps to review the Australian Army's experience in Vietnam. It produced a book-length account of what worked and what didn't in Vietnam. It contains detailed studies of the performance of major units and some minor units. For example, the Provo Corps gets several pages. But there was no mention of AATTV and very little on the Civil Affairs Unit. Some corps, like infantry, artillery and engineers, gathered senior officers with Vietnam experience to systematically examine uh, the uh, successes and failures um, that the lessons uh, and, uh, the successes and failures so that lessons learned at such high cost could be recorded and exploited uh, to improve future performance. One of the uh, outputs of that was a booklet titled Infantry Battalion Lessons from Vietnam. There was also a training information letter by, uh, produced by the engineers on engineers in counterinsurgency which does mention the engineers role in uh, civil affairs. There was also a training information letter um, on the application of indirect fire support that was produced by artillery. But there appears to have been no systematic attempt to collect the lessons from Vietnam for the training team and the civil affairs unit. Both were non-core specific, so they lacked an organisational champion to systematically compile their lessons. But all was not completely lost. Individual authors like Ian McNeil, who's the author of the team, and Gary Mackay and Bruce Davies, who wrote The Men Who Persevered, recorded the history of AATDV's efforts, along with the lessons learned and forgotten. The historian of the Civil Affairs Unit, Barry Smith, has written articles about the performance of the Civil Affairs Unit and is currently working on a new study of the uh, Civil Affairs Unit based on a database of over 550 civic action projects and that uh, study will probably uh, lead to the deepest analysis of the Australian Civil Affairs Unit to date. Finally, a, I think a key lesson um, that emerges out of the Vietnam War and indeed all wars is that data about all aspects of a campaign needs to be collected, ideally uh, for near real-time analysis. Wars are too costly in lives and treasure not to extract from them the lessons that might improve performance next time. For those of you who are not aware, uh, Dr Paul uh, is the uh, leader of a project team that has taken all 4,665 contacts in South Vietnam and in the period of 1 ATF from 67 to 71, and put them into a database to show you longitudinally and in great depth what happened in the conflict. And if you'd like to see a demonstration of the database both today at lunchtime and tomorrow at lunchtime, uh, there'll be a demonstration of that if you've not seen it. Uh, for instance, that they can show that the Vietnamese also knocked off for lunch, uh, showing the level of contacts through the day. But they've also moved to take public source data for Afghanistan and do the same kind of thing. And it gives you a vision of a conflict that perhaps you wouldn't get by any other means. So uh, Mr. Daryl here, who's at the back, will wave his arms around, who is historian of the commandos and former intelligence corps, they'll be available at lunchtime to show you both Vietnam and Afghanistan and what can be possible with data analysis. And it's a fantastic uh, project. Uh, your questions now, please. In the front here, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hall, Major Greg Colton from Army Headquarters. Um, I'm interested in some of the lessons that you, your study has brought out from the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam. Um, the, the importance of language training for advisors, um, the cultural training, uh, and also sharing, um, deploying on operations with the advise unit, um, which is almost exactly the same as the uh, RAND Corporation study, OP18, into advising um, Indigenous forces in Korea, El Salvador and um, Vietnam, which comes up with three key things. Language training, length of deployment and uh, sharing shared dangers. If we look now at um, where we stand as the ADF, uh, we have no formal language training for key advisors before they deploy. Uh, we have short tours between five and maybe ten months. Um, we have ever larger concentrations into training centres and we are not allowed to deploy and share the dangers with those we're advising. Um, 
taking your last line of learning key lessons, if you were to be able to, from your research, bring out any key points for the ADF to build into future indigenous capacity building campaign design, what would they be? Um, can I just uh, can I just have you go? Have you asked me that last before before the mic goes away? Just, could you just re uh, ask me that last uh, bit of your question, please? Yeah. From your study, if there were any key points that you felt the ADF should build into campaign design for future Indigenous capacity building, what would they be? Okay, yeah. Um, look, I think, I think we need to take a holistic approach to Indigenous capacity building. One of the reasons why I showed that, that uh, table of social developments in Fuk Hui province is, is that uh, I believe that uh, the military campaign needs to be fully integrated with the Indigenous economy and the Indigenous political system. I don't know exactly how to do that. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, you know, uh, going to suggest ways of doing that, but I think we need to find a way of doing that. We need to find a way, particularly, of building our military campaign such that it contributes to the, um, the economic development. Because I think that um, the economic development and political uh, reforms in the community um, are going to be what ultimately uh, drives uh, the, the, the creation of capacity. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think I'd really like to do some research on, I, 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 my, my research interest is in the Vietnam War, um, but one of the great values of the Vietnam War is that there is so much data that is publicly available. Uh, you know, these days, we can go to uh, Ho Chi Minh City and look at the archives of the South Vietnamese government. We can go to Hanoi and look at the archives of the North Vietnamese government. We can read histories of the campaign that are written by our former enemies. So there's a huge amount of data that's, that's there about the Vietnam War. That's what's so terrific for, about it for uh, researchers like myself. You can't do that with Afghanistan. You can't do that with Iraq because the records are all walled off. You can't, you can't see them. I can't go to, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the embassy in uh, Kabul and say, let me let me have a look at your records. They're going to tell me to go away. But I can do that by going down to Barton and I can see the records of the Australian embassy in Saigon during the during the Vietnam War. And so I can see what I can see. I can start to see how the economy and the military campaign meshed. And I think that's, you know, that's where there's gold to be found if we, if we start to do some research into that area. So uh, economics first, politics second? Yeah, yeah. and uh, social developments too. Not, not, simply, uh, not simply economics, but things like uh, you know, the education, the rule of law, how that, how that develops. Um, one of the things that um, I get uh, uh, excited about in, in, uh, in the Vietnam War Lots of things to get excited about in the Vietnam War, uh, but the one thing that I, one of the things that I really like is the, uh, is the penetration of radios into Phuc Hue Province. We've got some data about how many people had radios, and the radio is not just a radio. The radio provided illiterate peasants with information about the price of rice. It was they needed it if they're going to make a, you know, they're going to make some money out of their out of their plot of land. And there it is, sitting on the, uh, on the kitchen table, figurative kitchen table in a Vietnamese household. It's giving them information about the price of rice, but it's also allowing the president of South Vietnam to talk to them. Most Vietnamese peasants would have seen themselves as citizens of Zuan Mok or Dat Do or uh, you know, Binh Ba or some little town. They didn't have a, a terrific concept of the, the state as a whole. But with the radio, they're starting to get it. So, you know, something as simple as the penetration of radios into uh, the community gives the peasant more money in his hand. That's why he can go out and buy a Honda motorcycle. When he's got his Honda mot motorcycle, he doesn't want the bridge to be blown because that, he's got to cross that bridge to get to the market. So, you know, it, 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 it builds into the community a desire for stability. And that's, I think, what we've got to try and build. Uh, question behind and front. And then we'll have to, I'm afraid, have a next session. We'll leave the last two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Dr. Kennelly. Thank you for your talk today. Um, with your idea, uh, with the current environment especially, I can see your idea perhaps working in a humanitarian context, but with complex environments such as Afghanistan, perhaps Iraq, and maybe Syria, um, how do you think this will be perceived, coordinated, or even working in cooperation with other agencies like the UN, NGOs, civil societies, the Red Cross? Um, I know that in the recent decade, um, there's been an um, increasing number of coordination efforts, uh, especially um, uh, uh, preceded by the UN. Um, how do you think adding your ideas into a military campaign in complex environments will be received uh, by other agencies? Oh, look, uh, I, I, that, that sounds like one I should stay up, step well away from. Uh, but look, I think um, in gathering in gathering data about uh, the, in, the the operational environment, um, it's important to tap into uh, all the available sources of data, including things like the data that's available from the UN, uh, including big data analysis of you know things like cell tower use and and, and so on. Um, if we can gather that data, uh, we can get a better understanding of what's happening on the battlefield and what what's happening in the economy and what's happening in political reform. So, you know, I think it's very important to tap all the available resources, whether they're from uh, the UN, as you mentioned, or um, uh, NGOs or whatever. Um, but I, I can't speak for NGOs about how they might, how they might react to uh, what I'm talking about. So that being to flag that as a question, how involved in the area of these kind of issues may be viewed by those outside the, of the military mindset? Mm. So not part of that idea is something we can come back to. Last question, just over here, thank you. Uh, Don Deacon Bell, Estate and Infrastructure. Um, indigenous training and in civil affairs doesn't seem to be sexy for an officer's career. In World War II, Arthur Conlon and the Army Directorate of Research developed policy training doctrine for civil affairs in Papua New Guinea and other operational areas. By the 60s, these lessons were lost. In Vietnam, as you pointed out, the AATTV and Civil Affairs Unit were a strong part of the Australian presence. After 72, this capability and lessons were lost. We've reinvented these capabilities for Timor, Bougainville, Solomons, Iraq and Afghanistan. Going to the future, how can we, the Australian Defence Force, ensure that these capabilities are not lost in the next period of peace and then have to be redeveloped the next time we go into a conflict? Um, look, I, th I think we've got to elevate um, things like civil affairs and uh, uh, the training team to uh, a much higher level of status in, in the military. Um, those, those, that picture of those people unloading a pig off the back of a truck, uh, they're fighting the good fight. Um, Pig production in Book Tree Province took off like a rocket, and was a major. Um, Not the pigs. <laughs> oh, well, some, some of the pigs might have too. Uh, but uh, pig production and, the, and the, I should say the money that people made out of pig production took off like a rocket, and and that was part of the um, the creation of a prosperous, a, a more prosperous community, and that's that's probably uh, that probably had more effect on uh, the outcome of the campaign, at least up until the point that 1ATF was withdrawn, than some of the major battles we fought. So, you know, people have to understand that, I think. When we have to, we have to train people, we have to uh, do more research into it and promote that as a, uh, as a thing that is, that is rather sexy for uh, uh, people with a military career. I don't know how you do that, but we need to, we need to think about, and that's maybe another thing that we can put on the list of uh, things to think about is, you know, how do you get people to accept that uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, requirements like uh, civil affairs and uh, training um, really are very, very important and need to be backed. Would you please stand up?